My name is Chris Erickson. Uh, I'm an associate professor of history, and I teach classes in 20th century U.S. history. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about my research, and I think it's what drew me to history in the first place. Uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Montana, non-degree status. I was trying to figure out what to do, uh, whether to go to law school or stick in history. And I read one book that changed everything for me. Uh, and uh, the book was by John Hyam, Strangers in the Land, Patterns of American Nativism from 1860 to 1925. Um, and it's still, you know, he published it in like 1960 and it still is the classic study of nativism now that everybody who's interested in this reads. Um, and so after I read that um, and, and and really started thinking about what Haim was saying. I mean, he's defining nativism as this broad, uh, general anti-foreign sentiment that consists of three main elements, anti-Catholicism, anti-radicalism, and Anglo-Saxonism. Um, and after reading that, I decided that history is what I needed to do. It wasn't just what I wanted to do, it's what I needed to do. Uh, so I went ahead and finished my master's thesis at the University of Montana on the Ku Klux Klan in Butte, Montana in the 1920s. And then I went on to do my doctorate at the University of California in Santa Barbara, where I went to a, a different topic, um, related, uh, but it was different. It was on conservative women's political activism in the interwar period. Um, and that was a lot of fun to do. And when I came to IPFW, I got a few articles out of that. But something was always drawing me back to the Klan. Uh, and so I uh, published an article on the Klan in Butte. And then I decided I needed to write the book. Uh, and so s since then, I have been working on the book. The working title is uh, Fraternity on the Frontier, the Ku Klux Klan of Montana during the 1920s. And so the layout is going to be something like this. I'll have uh, some background material on Montana uh, to kind of set up the, the foundation for the Klan's arrival. I mean, there were a lot of religious tensions in Montana. Um, the APA, the American Protective Association, was a viciously anti-Catholic organization na nation nationwide, but it was very active in Montana. Uh, I'll talk about immigration uh, coming into the state, uh, working on the railroads, the mines, their homes, homesteading. Um, I'm going to talk about the legacy of World War I uh, on the state and the Klan's arrival. because. Uh, Montana, were, um, they were super patriotic during World War I. In fact, um, the Montana sedition law would serve as the model for the federal law uh, passed in 1918. So I'm going to lay the foundation, and I'm going to go to three main communities. And why I'm studying these communities is because I have membership records. Uh, so, and, and they're very hard to come by, but, I was, uh, but the Montana Historical Society in Helena has these membership records. Uh, so the first one is on Butte. The second one is kind of more towards the western part of the state. And the next two are in Harleton and Roundup, both smaller communities. Harleton was about 2,000 people in central Montana. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, another chapter, I might break up into two, I haven't decided yet, is on uh, Louis Terwilliger. He was the grand dragon of the realm of Montana, so he was kind of in charge of, of the state. And his desire to make the realm of Montana um, something that the imperial palace in Atlanta would be very proud of, right? I mean, he wants a lot of political activism. Uh, the Klan, of course, wants to get rid of Catholics. Um, uh, you know, in the schools and in, in government and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at, uh, at that. And then I'm going to add an epilogue that brings it up to current day. Um, I'm going to talk about the Montana militia that emerged in the 1990s. Uh, the Klan came back to Montana. And the efforts uh, continuing through today in the area of Kalispell and Flathead Lake, uh, creating a, a white supremacist community, uh, Little Europe. Um, and thankfully, the residents of Kalispell have risen up against that, but the sentiment is still very, very strong there, right? Creating this, you know, this white, all-white community. Um, and so what I've, uh, what I've done so far is most of the work has been done on Butte and on Harleton. And these are two very different communities. I mean, Butte was a mining city. Uh, it was rough. Uh, vice flourished there. There were immigrant Catholics. Um, 
they, did, they paid no attention to prohibition. It was the most open county in the state. Uh, and everybody recognized it, right? Uh, uh, Lewis Terwilliger said, you know, Butte is absolutely the worst place to be um, as far as alienism and, and Catholicism. And so uh, what I discovered is that the Butte clan, and fortunately I have the minutes from the meetings from some of those as, as well, um, you know, they tried valiantly to, to study the Catholic situation in the public schools, you know, how many Catholic teachers are actually teaching there. Um, you know, they, they wanted to hold a parade at some point, which was not going to work because obviously they'd get killed. Um, I mean, literally, there'd be a lot of violence in the streets. Um, and so what I've discovered is that they, they did not make a presence in the community. I mean, the community knew that the Klan was there. Uh, the mail was stolen. Uh, they had troubles finding a fraternal home uh, in which to meet uh, because nobody wanted to rent halls to them. I mean, it's really a very pathetic organization. And so they drifted more towards the social and fraternal aspects of the Klan. And the Klan was the great fraternal lodge in the 1920s um, in a time when secret fraternities really, really meant something. And so they, they were reduced to holding picnics and uh, setting up little benevolent funds for members in need uh, and so forth. And so it was, you know, that the Klan did not make a presence in Butte. But neither did it make it in Harleton. And that's what I find really interesting because there are 191 members, men, um, of the Harleton Klan uh, in a town of 2000. And most of these guys were the leading members of the community. They were prominent county officials, city officials. Um, you know, they held all the important offices. They owned most of the businesses in Harleton. Um, they were very active in the Chamber of Commerce, the Kiwanis Club, active in all the other major fraternities like the Masons. International Order of Odd Fellows. In other words, they really controlled the, the town. And so when they joined the Klan, uh, I think it offered them maybe another venue in which to help, you know, kind of manage things in, in Harleton. But their main concern was not stamping out Catholic influence because there weren't that many Catholics in Harleton. Uh, there weren't many blacks either. I think there were about four in the county. Uh, but they wanted to create this moral and prosperous and thriving community. And it turns out they could already do that. Right, as members of, you know, um, broader members of the community. And so in the end, they didn't need the Klan to make their point, right, because they were already in control. And, you know, they got tired, I'm sure as the, the Butte guys did as well, of funneling money into the organization. The Klan was a money-making operation, no doubt about it. There were dues payments, you had to buy the hood and the robe, um, you had to buy, uh, you know, you, you had to buy uh, into the fraternal degrees, um, all of those kinds of things. So in the end, along with a lot of the other national problems and the problems in Indiana as well, the, uh, which was the most powerful clan in, in the country, uh, the Grand Dragon, D.C. Stevenson, um, you know, raped, uh, kidnapped first and raped his secretary, um, chewed her up like a cannibal. Uh, she takes poison, she dies, but then she gives a deathbed statement kind of condemning D.C. Stevenson who ends up in, in jail. So there's a, there's a huge national scandal and it brought down, among other things, uh, the Klan nationwide.